All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and get started. If I start to fall short for time, I, I may just gloss over some of this. Uh, I have a Medtronic grant, uh, and that's my only disclosure. So when thinking about aortic pathology and new EVAR graphs, you really need to look at the entire length of the aorta. This, of course, starts with the aortic valve. And as you go down, the current uh, area of interest are the aortic arch with dual and single arch branch devices, the thoracoabdominal uh, space, fenestrated EVAR for juxtarenal or, or pararenal aneurysms, and then there are still some challenges with standard EVAR devices in terms of neck angulation. And now we have uh, iliac branch devices. So going from the aortic root uh, all the way down, uh, there's technology in development or in trial uh, to manage a variety of different pathologies. In terms of the aortic arch, there are definitely limitations. Uh, the anominate and carotid, of course, pose challenges. Um, there's still a reasonable amount of uh, stroke and then you still need to preserve valvular function, you need to preserve uh, flow to the coronaries. Uh, device migration under those forces in the proximal aorta are significant. And then, of course, retrograde dissection is still a, a major concern. So these are some of the challenges that we're dealing with. First device I'm going to present is that this is the Gore single arch branch device. You can basically use this device in multiple configurations. You can branch into the subclavian, you can branch into the carotid, into the anominate. Uh, you can combine that with a variety of bypasses, which I'll demonstrate shortly. Overall, the results are uh, favorable with, with this device. Uh, the main issue with all of these devices involving the arch is going to be the uh, stroke rate. Uh, the treatment lengths can vary. Uh, the Sometimes because of the distance between the carotid and the subclavian or the nominate to the carotid, uh, these patients may be prone towards uh, some proximal endo leaks. Um, this, was a, this was just published in Endovascular Today by uh, Dr. Dake and Patel, demonstrating a case of a subclavian arch, uh, subclavian branch device. This, sim this is very similar to the iliac branch device in its configuration in that there are two cannulae one for the main wire, and one for the subclavian branch. This is a very similar device. It's the Valiant Mona Lisa, or Mona LSA, from Medtronic. And similar can be used in a variety of configurations. Again, the main issue here is going to be uh, stroke rate. And this is still early feasibility, nine patients. It's really hard to make any strong clinical judgments about what's going about this. So when we're thinking of managing the aortic arch, you, you really got to keep the aortic zones in mind. Uh, if you're landing in zone three, it's not really an issue. As you start to progress closer to the aortic valve, these things become important. For example, if you want to land in zone two, currently we're doing carotid subclavian bypasses. With a branch device, you can just simply branch into the subclavian. If there's not enough room between the carotid and the subclavian, you may need to branch into the carotid, do the carotid subclavian bypass. Uh, this is an example of a carotid subclavian bypass that I did. This patient actually also had an aberrant vertebral anatomy off the arch, and we just did a vertebral transposition and a carotid subclavian bypass. If we're landing even more proximal into, say, zone zero, now we're starting to think about doing carotid, carotid, carotid subclavian bypasses, and this is also feasible to allow a single arch single branch device to treat the whole arch. Again, the results, the early results are, are favorable. The, again, I'm just going to kind of re repeating myself here. The issue here is, of course, stroke rate. This is uh, the Cook Zenith dual arch branch device. So now we're moving to dual arch. This device is designed to branch into the nominate and the carotid and uh, can be coupled with a carotid subclavian bypass to uh, treat the arch. Again, uh, similar to the single arch branch device, stroke rates are significant. In this, in this study, four TIAs, one stroke, one subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a more recent series uh, with, with improved results, lower stroke rate, improved 30-day mortality. And I think there's definitely a learning curve with these devices. 
This is the Bolton Relay dual arch branch device. It's constructed very similar to the Cook device in that it has two branches, one for the innominate, one for the uh, carotid. And this is this device here. Dr. Riambu from uh, Brazil published his series on the Bolton uh, dual branch device with a very favorable 30-day stroke rate in 26 patients, stroke rate of being 3.8%. Uh, for those who don't know, the, the quoted stroke rate for uh, surgical arch reconstruction tends to be around 10%, uh, or as high as 10%. So keeping that rate below 10% is critical. Another graft to keep on your radar is the Nexus endograft. The Najuda endograft, which is actually an arch fenestrated device. And this is that device, and you can see the fenestration here. And the results with this, uh, with this device are favorable in the most recent series that's published. Um, they had one, uh, one major CVA, one spinal cord ischemia, and they also had a celiac artery occlusion. Another novel device is the Thoraflex hybrid. This is a hybrid device where you actually sew the proximal aorta graft in surgically. Uh, this is one of our cases here at Mount Sinai. You can, this is actually the stent graft component that gets inserted into the more distal aorta. You can then extend as needed with your choice of stent graft. So this is a great device. You can branch, you can bypass the innominate carotid subclavian, or if you can't get to the subclavian, you can just do the carotid and innominate and either do a carotid subclavian bypass or just simply ligate. With the descending thoracic aorta, most are in the room are probably familiar with the current available thoracic stent grafts. The Cook Alpha is the current lowest profile device that's available on the market. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Cook Petticoat, which will be available hopefully in the United States by the end of the year. Um, Bolton also has a low profile de device that's currently in trial. Uh, Medtronic and Gore both have lower profile versions of their stent grafts currently in development. This is recently published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery looking at the pet petticoat device. Basically, what you have here is a thoracic stent graft. Uh, for the platform that's going to be released, it's going to be the Cook Alpha device to seal the proximal entry tear. And this is really for the management of acute uh, type B aortic dissection. So you cover the proximal entry tear, you manage the proximal aorta as needed, and then you extend down with this bare stent, we call it a petticoat. And this is, this is to help enhance the lumen, the true lumen, uh, allowing it to remodel favorably. In terms of the abdominal aorta, there are several devices, the, the anaconda device that's you know, meant to handle aortic neck angles of 90, 90 degrees or more. Um, and then of course, those with short or no necks, uh, we need to look at what technology is currently available. This is the Cook fenestrated uh, device. This is FDA approved uh, currently. Uh, for use in the United States. Um, the, since its actual inception, the number of ZFEN devices implanted has gone up dramatically. The results are, are very favorable. This is five-year data with 91% survival, 79% uh, freedom from major adverse events, and the primary and secondary patencies are 81 and 97% for the, for the fenestration. So, the results here are excellent. Technical success rate is high. The major drawback is this is a custom device, and we need to wait for it. Uh, that's led to the inception of this device, uh, the P branch, which is currently in trial, and we've implanted several here under Dr. McKinsey uh, at our institution. And this comes in two configurations. Uh, the configuration is based on the, the, the lay of the uh, SMA, and, and so, this allows off-the-shelf fenestrations, which, which is um, novel. And the results with this, preliminary results, this was just published. For those who are interested, they, you can re review this. This was just published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, and, and the preliminary results are favorable. And then, it, now we're moving into thoracal abdominal devices. Uh, this is a basically a device that's used to treat a variety of thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Usually you have a branch for the celiac, the SMA, and uh, the renals. And this allows to treat a, a broader range of anatomy than simply fenestrated. 
Uh, this is a pararenal aneurysm that we managed with Agora Tambi, and you can see this is actually one of the cases that was done here at Mount Sinai. Cook also has a thoracoabdominal branch device. And this is a recently published series on uh, fenestrated and branched endovascular devices. How am I doing for time, Jim? Not bad? Yeah. All right, so this is available. This was just published in Journal of Vascular Surgery for those that are interested. This was also just published in the Annals of Vascular Surgery. The iliac branch device is currently FDA approved in the US. This is an example of a iliac branch device. And th this is also just published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery um, recently. So um, this is, I'll end with this. This is an interesting case uh, where a patient came in. Actually, Jim, Jim helped me with this case, where we did, the patient had initially a valiant, I'm sorry, a talent, a talent device. We ended up putting a fenestrated device in, and then we actually brought the patient back and did a, a GORE IBE, various generations of stent grafts piecemealed. Thank you.